This is Stuart Patrick. On this installment of The Internationalist, we're delighted to be joined by Enrique Beruga, who is the president of COMEXI, the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations, and a partner of the Council on Foreign Relations and its new initiative called the Council of Councils. Today, I'm going to be talking to Enrique about Mexico's role as host of the G20 and what he sees from that process. Enrique, it's wonderful to uh, be able to have you here with us. Thank you, Stuart. It's a pleasure. Uh, as I, as I mentioned, Mexico is going to be hosting the seventh summit of the, the G20 countries in Los Cabos in June. Uh, what, uh, what are the main priorities that um, President Calderon has set for that uh, meeting, and what are your expectations of what might come out of it? Well, this is a very crucial uh, meeting because uh, the G20 has to deliver. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's no time to spare in terms of... Uh, waiting for the next year to get some solutions. I would say on the financial front, first of all, to have a different set of uh, uh, rules of the game worldwide. Uh, there is a mostly agreement to fund additionally the IMF, which is an important step forward. But then the question comes of what are you going to do with all those resources, 500 billion or so more uh, dollars for the IMF. But then, how to revamp the, the system is very, very important in order not to have other cases like Greece or, uh, well, the, the, the various crises that they have had in Europe. But in Mexico's agenda, I think this is very clever. Uh, there is the idea of uh, a green fund and, uh, and green growth, promote green growth, which uh, normally uh, people think that uh, being green is being inefficient, but you can be both more efficient, cleaner, and uh, at the same time to promote growth in a different manner. And I think that's a, a very good contribution of Mexico in that respect. And the third layer of the meeting in Los Cabos will be on uh, global governance, something we discuss here at the Council of Councils in that respect. And the third layer of the meeting in Los Cabos will be on uh, global governance, something we discuss here at the Council of Councils. And uh, that is basically, I mean, under what rules are we going to play in order to solve the most important issues of the world? folks we're open for business the United States is open for business this is from financialtimes.com originally more rich Chinese buy US property China has emerged as one of the fastest growing sources of international buyers for US real estate and what some see as a sign that China's rich are increasingly seeking to take their money out of the country then I have this article or a couple articles that I wanted to include at the end of last video which is the BP announces that Venezuela now has the largest oil reserves in the world. 
Also, global reserves have been increased by 1.9% from last year. Remember I was saying just in the last report from Wednesday that we actually have more oil right now than we actually need uh, because the prices are still so high, you know, because it has nothing to do with supply or anything like that. It's just like everything else, like the stock market. It's a big rig game of speculation that, and in the commodities market with our food too, so. It says here, Chavez reveals Venezuela has built its first drone. And it says here they partnered up with Iran, Russia, and China. So, you know, people like, you know, some of my relatives and that, they would see this story and be like, oh, we got to do something about Venezuela. They're just, they're really become a thorn in our side, right? You know, uh, so, and they see him as a serious threat, Venezuela. So, but uh, remember, BP announces that Venezuela now has the largest oil reserves in the world. Well, let's look at this article. U.S. military wants more drones in Latin America. So, Chavez gets his little first drone built and right away military wants more drones in Latin America so they're going to relocate their predator drones sending them to South and Central America so there's not just a surplus of oil there's a surplus of predator drones remember in the last video as well they actually have so many drones they don't have enough people to fly them and um, one of the concepts I, I, I it's probably not even me that came up with it but uh, is using um, is using children um, basically and putting in these little laboratories these little game rooms as they would call them and the children think they're playing games and they're actually flying real drones and killing people and who knows maybe eventually they'll go to that before they just do fully autonomous robotic um, drones so yeah this is just basically this announcement of using these drones in South America or Latin America came right after the Pew Research poll was released or a study suggesting that the Obama regime's use of unmanned drone strikes to kill terror suspects is widely opposed around the world. I don't know if you remember that. It says here, uh, Northrop Grumman awarded cybersecurity contracts. So they've been awarded this uh, contract. And then I found this one. Boeing receives its first international cybersecurity contract. And it just makes you wonder if it's the same defense contractors that bring you the drones and all that. Um, who is the real cybersecurity threat? Well, it's the same companies. Kind of like Norton Antivirus and all them antiviruses, uh, the big ones, Symantec and all that. They're the ones that are creating the viruses most likely. And then they say, oh, update your definitions. I just find it hard that this whole cybersecurity threat is going to be alleviated by having a few corporations that are going to take care of the entire globe's security. So. U.S. backtracks on claims Russia is arming Syrian regime. So, remember, I already talked about this before, but it turns out Russia was telling the truth, and the U.S. State Department today admitted the helicopters they were railing about were actually already owned by the Syrian government, and they had just been sent to Russia for repairs. So, yeah, what they're really concerned about is that, um, is that they're not going to get in there first and be able to start uh, dropping bombs or... Um, throwing 50 cal rounds down range at civilians, right? They want to be able to get in there and do that first. They don't want the Syrian government doing that and killing some of their uh, terrorists for hire, the rebels. Syrian liberators bearing toy guns. And it goes on here and it says that a video posted on YouTube uh, contained basically an underground fighters uh, it with ski masks and stuff like that. But it said one man in the group declaring the fight is in service of God. That's right. They always just like in Libya, they have the peace sign. Peace sign, right? Peace. So kind of like uh, basically the rebels dressing up as government forces, smashing down, doing door-to-door uh, -door raids and stuff like that, basically staging it. Everything was set to uh, project menace and resolve. There was only one problem. The weapons were not weapons at all. They were non-firing plastic children's toys. So all the headlines and links will be posted in YouTube's video description if you're new here. Washington-funded hula-style massacre, says analysts of the U.S. and NATO have launched a war on Syria by funding and training the terrorists who commit hula-style massacres in the Arab countries. They're talking about that suicide bomber that was traced back to the rebels. He said it here, or he added, that the U.S.-backed coalition is staging a massive casualty-producing event in Syria, namely the killing of civilians and blaming it on the enemy. Quote, this is from this individual professor at the Center of Research of Globalization, Montreal. Quote, this is... A war of aggression, it is not necessarily using the instruments of conventional theater wars, which is to come in with artillery and air force and so on, but allied special forces on the ground. So, U.S. vultures ties to fighters in Syria, CIA, CIA helping with logistics, but not arms, officials say that. That's, that's actually coming through the Saudis and Qatar and all that. Somehow, they're coming from the West and making their 
way into uh, the hands of the opposition. But it's not the CIA that's doing it. They're just doing their own little compartmentalization uh, role. So, yeah, that's right. Operatives, CIA operatives and diplomats have stepped up their contacts with the rebel terrorists in part to help organize their burgeoning military operations against uh, basically they're trying to get a regime change. So who knows? Maybe, right? Because they're saying right here the CIA is working with Saudi Arabia who's supplying the rebels with all these guns, right? And then Libya. So, oh, there's Qatar. Yeah. So they say they're providing communications training. Oh, logistical routes. Logistical routes. Yeah, we're going to stash a cache of weapons here and we'll give you the directions. That's what they mean. Israel may use military force to secure Syria's alleged chemical arsenal. So the Israeli army is considering using military force to prevent Syria's alleged chemical warfare stockpiles from getting into the hands of Hezbollah or Al-Qaeda. says Tel Aviv believes that Damascus is no longer capable of securing its arsenal. So kind of like Iraq. So this this is crazy. The largest chemical warfare stockpile in the world and warn that Assad's regime could treat us the same way as he treats their own people. So, which is a complete lie. And it's coming from Israel, who has the biggest stockpile of nuclear weapons, right? So at least that's what we're told. Iran looks to China and Russia for military support as pressure from the West increases. And they're talking about SCO, which right now includes China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. So it says here, Iran has gotten an endorsement from SCO, basically the Shanghai Co Cooperation Organization. Uh, it says here about the unacceptability of force. Well, they're actually doing training exercises using forces. So Putin, Russia, ready to respond to U.S. missile defense. So they said here, we should look forward and give response to these plans in a timely manner. Then we have Russia and India to start joint military exercises. They're calling it anti-terrorist training scheduled in August and it's called Indra 2012. Then I found this article, India US Joint Military Exercise. And this was a two week exercise that began in March 5th. So who knows, maybe they're changing size, maybe they're not, maybe it's just a big show. US South Korea call for end to North Korea provocation. So they're doing all the provocation, but they're calling for what? The end to provocative behavior. The countries are gonna what? Have a united front and boost cyber security. U.S. and South Korean artillery troops are conducting a joint live-fire drill on Tuesday. They're testing readiness against a potential North Korean artillery attack on the South. One U.S. artillery battalion and two South Korean artillery units are taking part. The exercise involves the use of the Multiple Launch Rocket System, or MLRS, which provides counterfire and suppression of enemy air defenses, light material, and personnel targets at a range of 9 to 186 miles. The purpose of this training uh, is to ensure that both the United States Army and the ROC forces are able to coordinate uh, our abilities in a joint fire effort. By doing this type of training, it only reinforces uh, the relationship between us and the ROC Army. Last week, North Korea made threats to strike South Korean media headquarters, which it accused of hurling insults at the North's new leader, Kim Jong-un. Okay, so you remember what I was talking about with SCO. Um, basically, they're what? They're growing. SCO partners are growing. And I came across this article, Troops Units Participating in Peace Mission 2012. So this is an exercise of the Shanghai, basically, SCO that they completed, and it was a, what, anti-terrorism exercise. Then we move closer to home here, domestic deployment. U.S. Army Chief says military will be used to provide rapid response options and address challenges in the United States itself. Says the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, like we saw in the beginning of the video, proposes that the U.S. Army be used to plan, command, carry out these domestic police missions. The CFR would see the Army use uh, to address challenges in the United States itself in order to keep the homeland safe from domestic disasters, including terrorist attacks. So it says here they'll dedicate active duty forces, especially those with niche skills, i.e. killing close quarters, providing civilian officials, probably many of them CIA and stuff like that, like mayors, with a robust set of reliable and rapid response options, i.e. special forces uh, getting bankers and that out of skyscrapers. Then we have Black Hills Help Soldiers Prep for Urban Warfare. That's right. It's called Golden Coyote Training Exercise. It has military units throughout the country and around the world from the largest National Guard training exercise in the United States. So it says here, the realism of nearby civilian population. 
Then you have Kentucky's guard training with West Virginia's guardmen. Then we have this soldier training with Bosnia forces. The Ukrainian government preparing for militia to suppress color revolutions created by the CIA and foreign troops enter into Ukraine for military training. It's a partnership for peace.